So, greetings. Um, I know I'm the last presentation in the symposium, so I'll uh, try not to keep you too long. Um, my name is Mark Post. I'm a lecturer at the University of Strathclyde uh, in the Space Mechatronic Systems Technology Lab. And um, I'm here to talk to you today about what is truly a future technology for CubeSats, I believe. Uh, vision systems, in this case, um, you know, targeting systems for a rendezvous type uh, maneuver or uh, orbital debris capture. And um, in my presentation, now, vision is a very wide area, so uh, I'm going to be coming, covering a number of things shallowly, um, some basic concepts. Uh, feature matching, which is a major concept in vision, motion estimation. Uh, visual correspondence uh, for identifying things, uh, some initial algorithm results, uh, some conclusions and, and future directions that I'm planning to take. So, CubeSat vision, I think, is, uh, is more or less inevitable. Um, CubeSats in the future will be working in closer proximity, whether it's formation flying or whether it's uh, space junk collection or inspection purposes. Um, so I think vision will be a, a significant part of that because vision has already been demonstrated in robotics on Earth uh, very successfully and has also, it's also very intuitive for humans because humans are very visual creatures. We can create visual algorithms. So I would, um, I would uh, foresee that we would have a, a, set, a set of stages uh, if you want a CubeSat to approach, say, another CubeSat like the one in the picture. Uh, we've got a little um, VGA CMOS camera or whatever on it, probably Fox Electronics. And uh, we would approach, identify that there's something there. Uh, we would get a better idea of it as we take several pictures in succession, like I have at the bottom. Uh, we'd be able to track the object, ultimately identify it, um, and we want to be able to do this fairly quickly, of course, because uh, even with low relative velocities, I would say you need at least to take one image per second, uh, or better, preferably. So um, to be able to try to implement this, uh, my, my uh, approach is a structure for motion approach, uh, which you may or may not have heard of. It's used in uh, robotic mapping, uh, phototourism, uh, applications like that, and this is some prior work that I've done uh, with a microrover that I built at the bottom, and a quadcopter, uh, and I've actually taken a series of images from both of these uh, vehicles, created a 3D point cloud uh, by identifying features in the images, and combined them so I can build this uh, point cloud map that you see at the bottom, that actually also includes information about where the quadcopter and where the rover are, uh, and that's called SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Uh, and that's a significant part of uh, most robotic systems. So to be able to apply this to CubeSats, um, I've taken a somewhat minimalist approach because our processing is very, very limited. Uh, there are several different kinds of image and visual feature descriptors that will identify features that um, you know, robots or vehicles can grab onto, uh, SIFT, SURF, BRISK, and FREAK. Uh, I'm using a descriptor called ORB, uh, which is uh, Orient Brief, it's called. And uh, it's open source, it's not patented, which is nice. Uh, and it performs reasonably well in a lot of cases because it has, uh, for one thing, it's orientation invariant. You use a matrix to steer the orientation so you can identify uh, what sort of a rotation your feature has. Um, it does corner detection, which is quite fast uh, to process and, and identifies an inten intensity centroid in each little patch in your image. Um, and we use what's called a brief, a key point descriptor. These are all acronyms, of course. Um, and that's built out of the intensity of your image at each key point. And we match those together over successive images to build up an idea of where all these features are. Um, so triangulation, of course, is a very important step because with triangulation, you take, you take several two-dimensional images and you build a 3D image out of them. Uh, so what we do is we match images together uh, between successive pictures uh, using the method called the, from the um, FAST Library for Approximate Nearest Neighbor Matching, or FLAN. Um, and what we do basically is, for the picture in the bottom, you can see we've taken several pictures at different poses in 3D space, and we've used the collection of those pictures to build up the point cloud that you just barely recognize as a cube at the bottom. Um, 
we do that once we've matched our points uh, by finding what's called the fundamental matrix, which is just a matrix that identifies a transform between each one of those pictures in 3D, uh, or 2D rather, sorry. And then from that we apply uh, camera translation, uh, camera calibration, which gives you the essential matrix it's called. From that, in turn, we can figure out each uh, 3D rotation and translation between our images, uh, between our camera poses up there. Uh, and this is done using um, using uh, techniques from Harkins and Zisserman, which are very well known in the imaging community. Um, there's actually, with this solution, there's actually four different possibilities. Uh, you have to check all four possibilities to find out whether or not your solution for rotation and translation is correct. Uh, once you've done that, you can actually triangulate uh, by um, iterative solution we use. Uh, you can locate the camera, which is a, a complicated uh, point and pose solution that I'm not going to reproduce here. And um, you can do bundle adjustment as well, and bundle adjustment is a least squares optimization that allows you to make this a little more precise, a little more accurate. Um, so that's essentially how you get a point cloud. Um, because you know, we've only got one camera, and I'm assuming we've only got one camera on our CubeSat, um, so we're doing what's called partially observable with bearings only simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, so you actually have to take two pictures with different, from different positions in order to get this 3D triangulation uh, for your points. Um, and you need three, more than two, preferably more than three images to get an idea of relative motion between you and your target. And um, of course, as you move, you also build up your point cloud. You get more points, you get more uh, correspondences between pictures, and you can build up a better model. Um, occasionally, of course, you don't get the points you need, so you have to back up one more image and maybe two more images until you can find two images that give you decent point correspondences. But basically, you keep going, uh, and you can transform all of these points into relative um, global coordinates with respect to your CubeSat, and, um, you can, and from that, you can figure out where your target is. So it's uh, not as precise as um, exact matching, uh, but it's reasonable, and the, the picture on the right is actually um, several hundred poses, uh, about 450 poses that I've combined in order to make that model uh, that you see. And the model does actually look like my, uh, my CubeSat that I actually photographed uh, that you see down there. You can also get a quaternion from this uh, for attitude estimation as well. So taking this further, of course we want to be able to identify what we're looking at and you know, accurately enough what it's posed is actually. So uh, the way we do that is correspondence grouping. Uh, this is a bit more of a processing intensive uh, part of the uh, method. Uh, first you have to get the normals of all of the points in your point cloud, so you have some idea of where surfaces are, where, um, where flat things are, you can, so you can orient your points essentially. Uh, and then we use not 2D descriptors now, but we use a 3D descriptor called SHOT. And uh, the SHOT descriptor is actually, it's kind of like a, a, a 2D image patch, except it's a sphere in three dimensions. And it's a histogram descriptor, which means you basically take a sphere like the one uh, in the bottom right around each one of these uh, key points you've selected. You figure out how many points fall into you know, the top left quadrant, the top right quadrant, each one of those eight uh, actually 16 quadrants that you see inside the descriptor there. And um, that allows you to reject noise, basically, because it's based on a statistical measure of how many points are near it and where they are. It's not based on um, exact measurements. And um, actually, you can use any kind of a measurement to build this descriptor, but they use uh, dot products right now because they're easy to calculate and because it basically identifies a um, an angle with respect to the normal. Uh, you figure out the angles to all of your nearby points, and that gives you a statistical measure of what your key point looks like. Um, and from that, you cluster. First of all, you have to match the key points, and this is an important thing because we're using flan again, uh, approximate nearest neighbor matching, and you cluster the points together, uh, and that allows you to effectively build your, um, build your correspondence between a 3D scene, between a model and what your CubeSat is actually seeing. So this will become a little clearer um, 
in the examples. Now, I've actually run through all of the steps that I've described here uh, using a set of, a large set of images, uh, in this case, 220 images from a, um, from a scene where I've got one CubeSat uh, on the right there. And my model that I built from you know, 450 plus images is on the left, so it's got a lot of points in it. And um, when you run this correspondence uh, between the model and the actual scene, uh, I started out with a descriptor radius of 0 0.05, which is fairly small, cluster size of 0 0.1. This is just in you know, arbitrary units, really. Uh, and I got 167 key points and 63 matches, which gave me a reasonably good estimate of what I was looking at, about 3% error in positioning. Um, if you double the descriptor radius, get more points in each key point descriptor, um, increase the cluster size, takes longer, but you can get 632 points, 594 matches, which, is, which actually gives you a very, very good uh, estimate of where it is. Now, of course, you might not have 220 images. Uh, if you've only got, say, 32 images, uh, and below that, actually, it becomes even more difficult. Um, I started with a, uh, about a third as many points in my scene. Same model as last time, same um, parameters. Uh, except this time, I've got 10% error in my first case. And uh, in my second case, uh, because I've increased the descriptor radius again, I only get 5% error. But the results aren't as good as previously. Um, of course, you're thinking there's got to be a trade-off here. And there is. The trade-off is amount of processing time uh, it takes in order to get this accuracy. So to give you an idea of how long it takes to do this, um, my reference platform is a 667 MHz uh, ARM Cortex A9, the one on the Xilinx Zinc uh, 7020, I believe the model is. And um, it's, it's probably powerful for a CubeSat, but certainly within what would be implemented, I think, in the near future. And uh, point cloud generation timing is not too bad on this. Uh, it's actually, um, it takes a significant time for feature detection. Um, but most of the operations for generating my point cloud are done, you know, a third of a second per pose. That's per pair of images that I look at. Um, correspondence grouping, of course, takes quite a bit more time. Uh, normals take time. Key points also take processing time, as you'll see in the orange. But the thing that really kills this algorithm is the fast approximate nearest neighbor search. And that takes 90% of my time when I'm doing correspondence grouping. So um, that's really the thing that needs to be dealt with. Um, just so you know, all of the, uh, the code was written in C++. I used OpenCV for the 2D parts, uh, Point Cloud Library for the 3D parts, as well as in a bunch of my own routines um, in between. Uh, we process per pose sequentially, so we don't have to do you know, combinatorical uh, numbers of uh, images at once. Uh, I have found increased descriptor sizes, of course, and also increasing cluster sizes both increase accuracy, descriptor size mostly, uh, but they also increase processing time, which is the critical part, and of course flan, as I mentioned, uh, the matching is 90% of, of what we need to overcome. So that's really the candidate for hardware acceleration at this point. In closing, this is not the only way to do vision for a CubeSat, of course. This is just one way. Um, we've certainly proven we can do visual identification and tracking. Uh, the accuracy is not too bad right now. It certainly could be a bit improved if we want to be able to actually do capture with a robotic arm or some such in the future, small robotic arm. Um, we could improve uh, feature detection and point cloud generation by optimization, certainly. But the thing we really have to deal with right now is the matching and key point generation for uh, correspondence grouping in 3D. And, um, you know, of course, there's other vital factors. Uh, if you're doing this, you need to have good image. You need to have good optics. Consistency of exposure in your cameras. Uh, or you could, for example, linearize each of your images and post-process them so they're all having the same exposure and speed of processing, which is my main point, really, in this discussion. To deal with that, briefly, uh, my next step is working on a DSP-based vision system based on a black fin board that I've built. 
I don't have a picture of it because it was just finished, but hopefully I'll be able to start on that shortly. Uh, it's also based on OpenCV and open source code. And in the future, uh, FPGA acceleration is the key, I think. And that's um, the step afterwards, I believe, uh, and where most of the games are going to be made. And this is just uh, prototyping that I've done in the lab. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, are there any questions before we close the session? the technical uh, part of the, the session and I think uh, this, uh, there's a closing remarks I believe uh, Jan's giving them. So I'd just like to thank uh, the speakers from, from the session, it was all very interesting and could you uh, join me in thanking in the usual way.